UNFCCC, and the Paris Agreement. ACE needs inclusive and meaningful citizen engagement, and this requires culturally relevant strategies to reach people where they are and to make sure that all people's stories, knowledge, ways of knowing, and ways of learning are included in ACE. So this session is to hear all of your input to help take stock of what's being done um, in different, by different cultural actors, including libraries, museums, cultural spaces, and education spaces and beyond. Um, and this will help highlight good practices, act as inspiration, and help us continue our work forward in um, elevating the role of culture in ACE. My name is Claire McGuire. I'm speaking from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA. And together with Climate Heritage Network, we are bringing this program together. So thank you all for being here. I, let's get started right away. I'd like to pass over to um, Ms. Valkasu-Buba, the Senior Social Welfare Officer, and Vice National Coordinator at Repa, uh, Repa, yeah. Yes. And next slide, please. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this event. Uh, I'm happy to share my experience from the ground. And uh, talking from a cultural perspective, uh, how we can put women, uh, local grassroots actors, into uh, policy and making their voices heard in uh, climate policies and actions. First, in the indigenous Mororo community, for example, women suffer from discrimination. They suffer the kind of double discrimination because they are discriminated by their own community before they suffer discrimination from external community. And this has led to the fact that their voices have been left behind and their opinion has been left behind for a very long time. Their voices are not heard. They are only in the house, they don't go out, they just live in the community. But the women, they have knowledge, traditional knowledge and culture that they use preserve the environment, they use to protect nature, and they use this knowledge to enhance, like, uh, for example, when there is a uh, transhumans, we do transhumans in our community. And when we do transhumans, we live from one place to place, our country to another place, we leave the place to regenerate before we come back to the place. This is another way of nature restoration and so on. And uh, the voices of youth also have not been heard much, because youth are also people who are left behind when it comes to cultural practices, traditional practices, because many youth nowadays, they think that uh, culture and tradition is kind of primitive, so they don't like want to associate themselves with culture and tradition. But surprisingly, they have realized that language, culture, and tradition are part of the solutions that we are looking for in nature. And they own the community, they have this knowledge, and they are passing the knowledge to the younger generation through intergenerational knowledge transfer. And the intergenerational press transfer and the youths who are there to become the future knowledge holders when they learn this knowledge and then they kind of integrate this youth and women into policy making spaces, into decision making places, I think their voices can be heard. Because as knowledge holders, they hold the solutions to the climate issues that we have today. They have the knowledge, they need to be integrated. And when they are integrated, they will find local solutions that will have global impacts. If they have these local solutions and they bring it to the tables of policy makers, they bring it to the table of uh, decision makers, and their voices or their opinions count in decisions, policies, and practices, the people in the communities, the local actors, their culture, their tradition is valorized. And when we valorize tradition, culture, language, and like our identity, the people, they feel ownership of many projects that are concerned with climate issues, they feel the ownership of these climate issues, the uh, projects, and then they will be the ones to implement the projects, and they are the forefront of the implementation. If not, if we come with a uh, big technological solutions, industrial solutions to them, you, they, will, they know that you have brought a project, okay, that is your own project, they are not part of it because they don't feel concerned. But once you integrate them with their cultural values, their traditions, their language, they take ownership of the actions and they implement these actions in the ground. Because we believe that they are the people on the ground, they are the ones to implement the actions on the ground. And implementing these actions, their cultural governance is important. 
Yeah, uh, self determined initiatives are important. Their yeah, language is important. So those are the things that I think we can integrate and make the voices of people, of indigenous people on the ground there. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a really important point when talking about the first priority area of the Glasgow Work Program for Action um, for Climate Empowerment um, policy coherence and including those voices, valorizing their knowledge, and bringing those that to the table um, when implementing policy. Um, Dr. Iman Fawad, you spoke as well, um, your project as well also looks at traditional knowledge. So could you speak a little bit to how um, your, your work helps um, impact on the second priority area of the Glasgow Work pr Program, which is coordinated action. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for all the audience who attended. Uh, let me start by my presentation. You know, I'm saying it? Yeah. Okay. The next piece. Uh, my name is Simone Gawet. I'm an architect. You know, architects tend to grab the information and Transmitted graphically or in the form of a presentation. So I would like to uh, share with you uh, some of our projects uh, in the Union of International Architects, as well as the UMAR, the Union of Mediterranean Architects. Next. Uh, actually, uh, we have a number of projects related to the UIA. One of them is the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals Commission, which I have the honor of co-directing it as well as the Great Green Wall Initiative. And we will move to the jewel of our crown, which is the Copenhagen Congress uh, next July 23. But we have also a, a number of activities related to architecture, education, and cultural heritage in, uh, in a generic way, which is with the UMAR as well. Next, please. Next. The first one is uh, how did we manage to have a commission? You know, the commission is a, a higher working body within any international entity. The SDG is one of the four commissions who are entitled to have relationship between the UN or any international entity, as well as the UIA. Next, please. So we are dealing with a number of uh, SDGs, not only uh, five or six out of the 17, but we are uh, focusing on the interdisciplinary SDGs. For example, the one who is associated with urban design and education or architecture and heritage. Whatever, which one, which field that we can help, we are eager to go through it with another entity. Next, please. You may know our activities from the social network or the uh, website that we have. Uh, till we, we are only five years old, the commission, but till now we had a lot of webinars, um, activities, and overall we have uh, been active throughout the UIE. Next, please. This is what we call the dissemination of it. A number of guidebooks, we wanted to know where do we fit within the SDGs? How can we help as architects? So we conducted a, a form of a survey within the architects from several members. We have 113 members. We call it uh, members, not countries that we are targeting their knowledge of the SDG and how can we, architect, help disseminate this info of the importance of the SDG within our designs and construction. Next. So we have this guidebook. It has two volumes in different uh, languages. Till now, we have English, French, Portuguese, Chinese, or the whatever we need to know how to integrate for young architects, for students, or even for practical side architects 
or are you able to integrate these SDGs but within the scope of only design? So because they are, you know, the SDGs of the UN, are, they are very general, they are uh, tackling all the aspects of development. So we need to focus how we architects can apply them into our design. Next. So we are dealing with several activities. Projects, next. <laughs> Publication and international events. Next, please. Okay, next. <laughs> but anyway, we, are, we have this idea of being able to work or to have this impact as architect within the SDGs. Next. Uh, whoever went to the, the 20, the, the, the habitat thing, the, the habitat with the urban forum in Poland uh, last May or April, uh, you may have seen the results of our competition, the UIA 2030 award. It was within six pillars who are uh, very often used as SDGs, and we had the, the results um, announced to the public in this uh, event. Next. Uh, this is what we called our um, uh, relationship be with, between the SDGs and the education. This year, we launched the award for integrating sustainable development goals within the architectural um, programs. We are aiming not only to have a program, academic program awarded, but we are aiming to have this info disseminated. So we have parallel um, objects for seminars within it. This is the first seminar that we had uh, at the end of last uh, month. Uh, we are targeting to uh, have this info within the students, how to integrate SDGs in their uh, graduation projects, to professors, how to integrate them in their curriculums, and to programs and um, schools. The idea is to share information between the North and the, and the South. It is the second edition of the work. Last year, we had a number of participants from all over the five regions of UIA, but we didn't have enough from the developing countries from Region 5, which is Africa, and Region 3, which is Latin America. So this year, we are targeting this kind of participation. Next. And the Great Dream World. Uh, for those of you who, who didn't have enough uh, uh, info about it, it's uh, uh, an ongoing project with the uh, Union of Africa, uh, African Union. It uh, targets the f fine line between the Sahara and the Sub-Sahara. This is the line which is very critical for this kind of inhabitant in this 11 countries. They are suffering from more desertification and they are suffering also from social impact of this. They have the largest number of um, immigrants to the, the north, of course, and we're targeting how to integrate this as a, we as architects to minimize this neg negative impact. Next. So we had this idea of uh, student competition in whatever uh, country that you choose as a student within the 11 countries. The idea is to, to have a settlement uh, to host 25 uh, families. We wanted to have this uh, limited number of families because we are targeting to revive the vernacular architecture there, to uh, impose some kind of passive design that is not usually used in this part. But the idea is for us more than this. We're not only targeting the African continent, but we would, would like to have this as um, a best practice in other related uh, areas. For example, all hot dry climate within the other continent, it exists in Latin America, in the States, uh, in the southern part of course, and some, kind, some places in uh, Australia and uh, the Asian countries. So we want to explore in this kind of climate, not only for this, of the Next, we have a, a, a large number of uh, attendees, not only as participants. This is the first time in the history of UIA that we had uh, more than 1,200 applicants. We usually get less, num less participant number than this. But we wanted also to have a number of webinars and media um, uh, dissemination of what is vernacular architecture there and how to benefit from the lessons learned that because it persists till now, but to, um, uh, to have it in a more contemporary way, the lessons into what needs the society now, to lessen the number of refugees or whatever social impact or uh, problems that we may have. Okay. Next. 
So Copenhagen Congress, which is uh, the result of being Cop Copenhagen being the capital of architecture in 2023. It's a marvelous city that we uh, had the opportunity to visit uh, last September in our council meeting with the UIA. But we are targeting the largest number of attendees and participants in the history of any Congress of the UIA. A number of um, uh, uh, yeah, members of the architectural world or even with the political side of this issue are uh, our NBTs during July of next year. And we have six panels with the theme of leaving no one behind. It's um, a con uh, focusing on the SDGs or the sustainability as a theme, but with this idea that nobody has the right to be left. Let us grab everybody who, are, who doesn't have the resources to be sustainable, to be in this theme, the global theme, within the North and South exploration. Next. You may know that UMAR uh, also focusing on the Mediterranean region. It is uh, a regional um, entity which is related to the UAE. Till now, it, uh, the most famous activity that we do is the summer workshops. Every year, we uh, host uh, uh, students from the 13 members of the UMAR. They are within the, uh, the perimeter of the Mediterranean. And we ask uh, several schools of architecture to host them, but with, with a specific theme for this year. Every year we change the theme according to the global demands. Okay. My, my last one. Next. So this one is related to our focus. It was in the south of Tunisia. Next. We had uh, a next and next. We had uh, three focus uh, uh, cities in the, in the south. It is Matmata, uh, Dwiret, and Shnini. They are known to be caves and underground uh, architecture. Next. So we invited the students, next please. We invited the, the students, next please. We invited the students to live for two weeks in these groups, underground and in caves, to learn about the traditional way of living there. And the, the exercise that we imposed to them was to recreate this village in a more contemporary way, without losing any of its authenticity. Next, we had a large, a large number of um, activities or uh, results of this redesign. Next, which is um, related more to the influence of uh, living in these caves to the thermal comfort of the users. Next, 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 <laughs> next, please. And we uh, developed this uh, um, uh, cultural idea of the students into their the, um, uh, uh, radiation projects in the next year. Thank you and may I <laughs> may I invite the audience to just check our Facebook and the website of the UIE and we would like to welcome you in Copenhagen next year. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think there's a you covered so many um, ways to get students involved, to get different people from, involved in this work in a really hands-on way. And I think moving right along to the third um, priority area, which is tools and support, um, I'd like to invite Heba Ismail, the Vice President of the Arab Federation for Libraries and Information, Libraries Technical Manager for Egypt's Society for Culture and Development, and a member of IFO's Regional Division Committee with Nina, to talk a little bit about how libraries help um, in this priority area. Please have a institution in which to turn this commitment into action as public access as well as champion for access to information and lifelong learning. Libraries are well placed within the communities to be hubs and to have a rule to action for climate empowerment. Libraries are enablers and drivers of sustainable development. In the next few slides, I'll explore examples of uh, what public libraries in Egypt are doing and how they have supported the elements of this action for, uh, for climate empowerment 
uh, through their activities and opportunities for uh, uh, future engagement. Next, please. Uh, we will start by uh, education and uh, Bibliotheca Alexandrina in cooperation with Singor University target Francophone students uh, and those who are studying uh, French as a second language. And uh, today morning they have uh, we have two workshops. Um, uh, we're contacted today and um, um, are tailored to increase student environmental awareness and understanding uh, uh, of changes in the climate and its impact. Uh, on the quality of life in general through arts and games. Next, please. For public awareness, uh, the following programs uh, provided by many libraries. Uh, as a start, is the Society for Culture and Development and it's not a non-profit organization. Um, uh, Supervised mainly public and the children libraries in Egypt across uh, many governorates. Uh, it made a cooperation with the Greater Cairo Water Company to uh, uh, organize an awareness workshop and um, educating young people about environmental issues. Next, please. Um, also, ESD or Society for Culture and Development cooperating with holding companies for water and uh, wastewater to organize serious workshop and visual shows and official competitions through um, games and puppets. Um, Bibliotheca Alexandrina have the World Environment Day in cooperation with Greater Cairo Public Library, the Climate Specific uh, Federation, the, uh, the Federation for Civil Association, and the Egyptian Library Association. The seminar tackles climate changes and their impact on agri agriculture and livestock um, production and uh, the means to address them. It also discuss the methods of uh, rationalizing water consumption. Um, next, please. Next, please. For this uh, uh, promising uh, environmentally friendly childhood, uh, this was... No. Yes. Uh, this public library uh, system in cooperation with the faculty of uh, early child education kind of university and education. workshop conducted uh, by teacher and organic children uh, for people with special needs and, uh, and they need origami and uh, crafts. Also, uh, they held in cooperation with Rotary Egypt uh, to carry out agricultural uh, activities. The third event includes a variety of activities that the teacher uh, carry out with the children such as puppet theater and concentric mon monastery uh, activities. Uh, on uh, rationalizing the consumption of energy, water, and electricity, and preserving the environment. Uh, for the training, different training was we provided for both uh, children and uh, uh, adults, and also uh, for librarians. For the public participation, Bibliotheca uh, Alexandrina. Um, um, witnessed the launching of the volunteer program of the United Nations Climate Change Conference COP27. Dr. Mibina Kabash, Minister of Social Solidarity, uh, addressed the volunteers by video conference during, the, during their uh, gathering at the library and discussed the ministry's efforts in preparing around 1,300 volunteers to organize the Climate Change Conference. Uh, next, please. Let's be green. This is uh, a cooperation between Maadi Public Library and uh, the United Embassy uh, in Cairo. Uh, launched Let's Be Green environmental activities within the framework of project for ages 14 to 18 years old. And uh, um, it's about doing a project relating to uh, air pollution, climate change, uh, ozone layer depletion, water pollution, and uh, the children try or, or they just try to find solution for each issue. The uh, Bibliotheca Alexandrina organized uh, the Council for uh, Youth um, 
and um, uh, it's held in several countries around the world, um, uh, which aims at raising the awareness of urban residents about climate change. The competition is an opportunity for young people uh, to particular in, uh, particularly in developing, uh, to develop ideas and address local climate challenges. Next, please. Access to information. We have um, a green corner in each library. This was um, a cooperation between libraries and uh, the Ministry of the Environment. Uh, and we try to provide many books for children and youth uh, and make libraries free. Uh, the last one is international cooperation. Uh, Bibliotheca Alexandrina, in cooperation with uh, Singor University, organized an interactive conference via Zoom titled Yes to Green. Uh, the conference addressed uh, the role of formal and non-formal uh, education in promoting literacy on climate change as well as theme of green libraries as a new trend uh, uh, in the world of libraries and information. Uh, finally, as climate change is a human uh, caused problem, human-centered solution will be the key to its successful mitigation, empowering our community to develop uh, participation in learn about and impress uh, this solution is a powerful, powerful way uh, for libraries to enable and drive change. So let's um, count on libraries, let's count on culture, and we have to act now. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love all, how all of these ideas use um, reach out in the community in different ways and use different partners. Can we move right along as well in tools and support? I'd love to hear your input, Bella Rooney, um, from Protecting Paradise podcast and Plastic Free Payment. Um, can you please? Hello? Yes. Yeah, we hear you. Okay. <laughs> Take the floor. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, thanks so much for having me here. We're from Youth Delegates from the Cayman Islands on behalf of National uh, National Cultural Foundation. Um, the Cayman Islands, and as Heba was saying, uh, education, especially for me, I think is one of the biggest ways that we can really uh, raise awareness for ACE. Um, and in Cayman, we have several cultural actors that do that, one of which being the Cayman National uh, Trust, sorry, Cayman National Trust, who is a non-governmental organization created to preserve the history and biodiversity of the Cayman Islands. And they have multiple educational uh, programs, like Luwana Guardians, Cayman Sea Sense, where they, you know, go into local businesses, teach them about the climate, teach them about uh, fish stocks and how they can be sustainable, lots of things like that. Summer camps for kids and uh, Heritage Heroes Youth Conservation Club, which is really targeting the young ones and getting them started and understanding um, how our heritage is linked to our nature and to climate and everything like that. And they have a new uh, climate literacy program for schools as well, which is going to be starting to get implemented, which is amazing. It's just an amazing way to start at a young age implementing these, these ideals. Um, we also have another group called the Cayman National Cultural Foundation. And this, this, this centers around storytelling and around uh, taking old stories from people's youth, people's heritage, people's traditions, and, and bringing them up once a year at a storytelling festival to remind people how they're connected, especially in Cayman, to our uh, maritime, to maritime heritage and to our oceans and how we're all really interlinked that way. And that's a really great way to not only empower youth, uh, but to remind the older folks maybe that <laughs> we have a whole past and that we're really connected to our land and Cayman is such a, such a hub of, of ocean activity. Um, we also have the National Art Gallery, which I guess is another way of storytelling, but just two paints and, and arts and crafts. Um, and in the past, they've done things like Seawater in Their Veins exhibition, which is just basically, it sounds exactly what it says. <laughs> we have seawater in our veins, and it's reminding people of their connection to the sea in all aspects of, of life in, in the Cayman Islands. And through collaboration. So we have a, for instance, we have a massive dump in the Cayman Islands. It's a bit of a problem, and sometimes it lights on fire because of climate issues. Um, and that di uh, disaster risk resilience during these events, uh, we have to come together. So the National Gallery and the Cayman National Trust came together to save all of these pieces of art and heritage and pieces that link people and remind people why you know, we love our nature. And things like that, we have to work together to preserve Cayman's heritage that way. And lastly, um, youth opportunities, I think, making sure that to access ACE, for me, I think starting from a young age and youth opportunities, for one, that the National 
Human National Trust has brought myself and my uh, friend Aliyah here to COP to join and to learn from all these amazing, amazing people. And as somebody who has passed on environmental issues, by people like I'm a youth delegate from the Cayman Islands and I just wanted to know the, um, the implementation strategies that I think we can use to monitor and evaluate uh, people that climate change or climate action. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry. So a smooth and deliberate interaction between governing bodies and the cultural groups they oversee is extremely important in creating successful and sustainable plans for present and future environmental development. Too often, decisions are made by those at the top of governmental hierarchies, behind the closed doors of a meeting room, excluding those who work regularly within the community, and we would be able to share key insights about what needs protecting and how best to do that. In a world where we have access to virtual meeting mediums of almost every kind, there is no excuse for this to continue happening. So in the Cayman Islands, we have, as Bella said, we have the National Trust of the Cayman Islands, and we also have the Cold the Cayman National Cultural Foundation. And what they do is they work to preserve our heritage and our culture through education and um, environmental uh, projects. And they also put on various events and projects that highlight where we were and where we're going, where we've come from, and what our future is likely to be. Uh, I think it's an extremely important for collaboration to take place between groups like the National Trust and governing bodies, because realistically, if you want to document and understand people-led climate action, you need to be on the ground with these people that are in the communities and understand how the culture works, right? So if you if you wanted to understand if a bunch of school-age children like their lunch meat, you wouldn't ask their teachers, and you wouldn't ask the janitors, you would go into the schools and you would ask the children themselves, hopefully, right? So it's the same concept, that same idea that we want these people to be invested in their culture and invested in their, their environment, so why are we not speaking to them directly and understanding what it is that they want us to do? So that brings me to my first idea or of a project that I like to call the C3 Coalition. It's the Collaborative Cultural Council, and essentially what it would be is a group of regular, a group of um, organization leaders having regular, if not frequent, collaborative councils between themselves and government officials. So those would be your members of parliament, your ministers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. People who represent both sides of the coin. And these cultural and rep cultural groups and representatives um, would serve as experts in terms of the governmental organizations understanding what exactly are the issues that the community is facing rather than just trying to address issues that they know nothing about. So one thing I really like about this idea is that it makes communication really, really easy and seamless because if everybody is in the same room and can kind of put their cards on the table and establish that we need help and we want your help, then you've already stepped on, the, that's the first stepping stone to making sure that people's needs are met and that the environment is being taken care of in a way that is culturally significant and culturally appropriate. The various ministries that would be in attendance uh, would be able to share reports on progress and available resources because obviously we can't request things of a government agency if we don't know what is what we already have, right? So we need to be able to see these reports and understand that you know we have this amount of resources that we can allocate to this project and this project and that project and we want you guys to head up this section so that you can come back to us and let us know what exactly it is that you want us to do differently or do in the first place. And um, in my thinking it's best to establish a bit of a routine with these kinds of groups and I think the cultural actors would be able to present initiatives and plans that they have because I definitely think that in a lot of grassroots organizations that work with people, they have amazing ideas about how best to go through different projects and ideas with the community. But because of that, 
glass ceiling between the grassroots organizations and the governmental authorities, they aren't able to do that. So I think this kind of coalition, this kind of group and collaboration is really important for making sure that people have a say in their own government and have a say in how they're interacted with. Um, and my second and final point is about culture and environmentalism. So I'm a firm believer that culture isn't just about um, your maybe like cultural fairs or your cultural dress. It's also about how you understand yourself and the people around you and how you understand in this instance your environment and the importance of it and the importance of things like waste. So um, in this instance, in this example, culture would, um, the cultural actors would petition the state parties to put out, say, interviews or surveys that would really get to the bottom of what the community thinks is the issue and how best to solve that. Because there's no one that's gonna know better about cleaning up the street than the person that lives on that street, right? Um, and this kind of, this careful data collection would allow government authorities to see that people have, want to have an impact and they have opinions on these things. And there are tangible things that we can do to change that and to change the issues that are happening, but there needs to be a middleman. Um, I think it would also be extremely important to do this kind of project in schools where we can understand why students aren't as involved as climate activists as we would want them to be. Because everybody talks about um, being involved in your government and being involved in the fight for fight against climate change. But realistically, I don't think a lot of students feel that way because they aren't exposed to it or they don't see it as important. And when you find out why, you can go in and change those and give incentives and make sure these students see that being part of their environment and, and taking care of it is important. So I think this knowledge would equip the state and government authorities to create a foundation that makes young people feel like they can change their environment and and have a positive impact on it as well. So I'll just um, conclude with saying that if we want people-centered climate action, state parties need to interact with these people and give them the tools to influence legislation and project, projects within the sphere of environmentalism. Thank you. Um, I've heard a lot of the same. Um, I, I, I thank you again to everyone who shared your ideas, who shared your work. Um, and who shared concrete ideas for ways forward and things you're already doing looking forward. And I think one of the key questions that we keep coming back to is um, this work is being done, but how do we how do we elevate it? How do we amplify it? And how do we uh, um, ensure that policymakers see the work that's being done and help facilitate um, this to be integrated into policies, to be integrated into strategies? Um, and to be um, supported so it can continue on. And I've heard, um, I loved these ideas at the, of this participatory um, processes that you've, you've brought. And I think it really goes back to your, um, the, our, our first presentation of valorizing the, um, the knowledge, valorizing the traditional knowledge, valorizing the experiences of people. And then um, we've heard other stories of, of platforms that are already doing this in libraries, in, um, in universities, working with students, working with um, really innovative prizes and different ways to innovate ideas. And I think um, there's there's a lot of pieces that can come together. Working in, in circles, and, and our call is for um, is, is for policymakers to listen to what we're doing and to include us in what we're doing and to support us in what we're doing. So, on that note, I want to thank everyone again deeply for sharing your experience here. And um, at COP 27, I think it's a very it's an important um, aspect that we're bringing to the conference. So, thank you again for your time. Thank you to everyone.
Thanks, Thank you. Um, when we're talking about 
faith, action, proclaim empowerment, reaching people who might not engage already in this topic um, in, a, in a, a public interest way like that, where they say, oh wow, that's an interesting story, I want to learn more, is, is a way to open a door and to um, expand a platform. So I think a call from, from another side of heritage, is uh, pres preserving heritage, is to say, um, where it's not just a nice to have, it's, it's a need to have, and it's a resource that, um, for climate action. Um, would anyone else like to, to add? Um, is there any other questions? All right, in that case, thank you for that question. I think that was, um, it's, a, it's a key question that perhaps is not being, making its way up into enough discussions, but we're um, so glad you all joined us here. Um, to help us add this to the discussion um, during COP27. So once again, round of applause for every for our panelists. <laughs> and uh, with that, I conclude the session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Salma, you are Salma. Yes.